This book reveals the darkest secrets kept underneath Mount Shasta. But to understand it in context, we need to first understand the story. In the summer of 1883, a young teenager named Frederick S. Oliver was helping his family marking the boundaries of their mining claim right around Mount Shasta. They drove wooden stakes into the ground and would mark the location and log it down in their notebook. But while doing this, something very strange began to happen. Oliver's hand began to shake uncontrollably and he began to write down against his own will. Now the boy began to panic, running home as fast as he could. However, his hand continued to write and write as much as it could. Now when he had got home, his mother actually gave him paper to write things down on and the initial seizures would stop shortly after revealing the beginnings of a bizarre text. Now, over the next three years, Oliver's hand would occasionally be overcome by this strange, mysterious force, writing several more pages here and there, until finally, in 1895, he had completed an entire book. Now, I'm telling you, the twist to this story is going to blow your mind. Four years later, Oliver died at the age of 33 in 1899. His book was finally published in 1905 by his own mother, Mary Elizabeth Manley Oliver. Now, his book at the time was so bizarre and supposedly unveiled the secrets of what lay beneath Mount Shasta. In fact, it became a huge classic among the occult and spiritual community. It's been so influential that in 2023, there have been several New Age belief systems, cults, and sects who openly reference this book as one of their sources of their own New Age belief system. Now, in addition, another book was written directly after it that sequels the first book. But it wouldn't stop there because several more bizarre things would continue to happen all over and around Mount Shasta. Fast forward to 1931 and a man named Harvey Spencer Lewis, who used a very specific pseudonym, wrote a book on the strange phenomena that was currently happening around and underneath Mount Shasta. May 22nd, 1932 saw an odd account published in the Los Angeles Times involving a Mr. Edward Lancer who was passing by Mount Shasta on a train and as he looked out the window he claimed to have seen a strange almost blinding reddish green illumination blazing off the mountainside and because this anomaly was so out of place Lancer began to ask the train conductor what it was that he was witnessing and was astonished to hear that it was the exact same phenomenon that had been occurring underneath Mount Shasta that people in the area at the time had been reporting and talking about. Now, determined to learn more, Lancer actually ventured out to investigate the strange light further, looking for a source. He even went as far as speaking with locals and talking to people in areas around the towns, all of which they confirmed that there were strange things going on under, around, and on the mountain itself, even coming into their communities. They had told Lancer that this mysterious light source would actually light up the whole side of Mount Shasta. Now, Lancer, who made his intentions known to all the local communities to go and find out the trace of these bizarre lights, he noted that the local officials and ranchers and people freely ridiculed my avowed trek into the sacred precincts, assuring me that an entrance was as difficult and forbidden as an entrance into Tibet. Lancer knew there was something they were trying to hide, but what? Whatever happened to him just seemed to just whew, vanish into obscurity. June 27th, 1940. The Mount Shasta had a piece in it written by a William Cook, where he spoke about Professor Edward Larkin of the Mount Low Observatory. Now, according to Cook's article, Larkin actually claimed to have observed something mystical on Mount Shasta using his telescope on multiple occasions. The story goes that Larkin had discovered this light anomaly by accident in the process of calibrating his telescope. And this is when he noticed something, a shining anomalous light right there on the mountain. 
Now, this greatly intrigued Larkin, and so he focused and found not only the source of the bright light, but many marvelous things that would blow his mind beyond comprehension. Now, according to Larkin, the display of light far exceeded our modern electrical achievements, and he was consumed with curiosity to know how much of these light anomalies could produce such amazing light effects. In fact, the claims were so out there in left field for most people that the author of the article, William Cook, spent the majority of the piece trying to just debunk Larkin's claim, mentioning that from his vantage point, it would have been physically impossible for Larkin to even see the light source from his spot of location, not to mention debunking what he actually saw. But the mystery of what's underneath this mountain gets even stranger, because in 1962, the Australian Flying Saucer Review published an article by Andrew Thomas, which talks about a strange event that took place. Now, according to Thomas's article, a forest fire had apparently ravaged much of Mount Shasta in 1931. However, locals had reported a curious phenomenon which saved much of the mountain from being consumed and engulfed by fire. Now, as the fire began to advance, something miraculous happened. A mysterious fog appeared, rolled out, and halted the blaze in its tracks, stopping it from damaging anything any further, preventing any spread of fire. Now, after the fire had been fortunately extinguished, locals discovered that a perfectly clear and curved zone remaining between the charred earth and undamaged areas existed. And at this time, no one could explain this bizarre anomaly or why it had taken place. And in 1930, before, the Stockton record told of a very bizarre account that took place in 1904. The story concerns a British prospector named J.C. Brown who had come to Mount Shasta with the Lord Cowdray Mining Company to search for gold. Now, one day while exploring the mountain, Brown stumbled upon a tunnel in the hillside of the mountain that led down into darkness. Now, of course, he was intrigued and curious, and he wanted to venture down further inside. Now, this tunnel weaved and stretched and went on for miles and miles into the darkness, but would eventually lead Brown into almost a complex of rooms, all filled with a variety of different kinds of treasures and stones. And in fact, there was one room that held an archaeological discovery. Mummies. Mummies underneath Mount Shasta. Brown was ecstatic about his discovery and claimed that it was one of the most exciting archaeological finds of the century. Now, his account eventually caught the attention of an expedition led by John C. Root, which was comprised of around 80 members, and they set out to further explore the tunnel. However, on the day the exploration was set to begin in June 19, 19. 34, of course, J.C. Brown was nowhere to be found. In fact, he was never seen again. This strange disappearance has led to many questions of authenticity of Brown's claims and the existence of the mysterious underground complex with treasure and mummies that he supposedly found. Now, despite this, many modern explorers have claimed to have found Brown's hidden tunnel with treasures and mummies, although its location and even its existence remains a mystery. Now, are you ready for the twist to all this? This will blow your mind. Where tens of thousands of people descend on Northern California's majestic Mount Shasta, considered to be the crowning peak atop a fifth dimensional light city inside the earth known as Telos Lemuri. As it turns out, the book that Frederick Oliver wrote about didn't just reveal secrets underneath Mount Shasta, but it actually detailed an entire underground city inhabited by beings known as Lemurians. The book chronicled and described the existence of the secret Lemurian city and their history. Oliver claimed that he had been chosen by the Lemurians as their secretary and that the whole book had been telepathically channeled through him and onto paper via writing. Frederick Oliver had even claimed to have seen the city with his own eyes. Now, he stated that he had actually been taken to the city via astral travel, which was apparently deep within the mountain. The city consisted of vast amounts of tunnels and secret doors that were automatic, elegant and beautiful architecture, apartments that were plated with gold and carpeted with luxurious fleecy substances. In fact, the entire city was said to be 
be decked out in crystals and gold and bronze and silver and all sorts of beautiful brimming precious stones and was powered by crystal engines, brightly illuminated and inaccessible to any outsiders without the expressed invitation of these Lemurians themselves. Oliver went on to describe the technology of the Lemurians as being incredibly advanced. He spoke of numerous gadgets and gizmos and vehicles employed by the city's residents, including but not limited to a large cigar-shaped airship. The book was groundbreaking and ahead of its time, making detailed mention of high concept notions such as quantum mechanics, anti-gravity, mass transit, zero-point energy, which Oliver referred to as dark-sided energy. Now, the book got attention at the time just because of how strange and left field it was, and as he mentioned, the sequel book, An Earth Dweller's Return, would only add to the validity of this for some new age groups. Most notable of them are the I Am movement. According to the legend, the Lemurians are a highly advanced race of beings who once inhabited the lost continent of Lemuria, which is said to have existed in the Pacific Ocean thousands of years ago. The story goes that when the continent of Lemuria sank beneath the waves of the ocean, the Lemurians retreated to the safety of Mount Shasta, where they created a hidden, deep city under the mountain. Now, this city is said to be accessible only to those who are spiritually enlightened or have been invited by the Lemurians themselves. The Lemurians are believed to be peaceful, highly evolved beings who possess advanced spiritual technology, and they are said to live in harmony with nature and to be dedicated to the well-being of Earth and everyone on it. Some people believe that the Lemurians are still within Mount Shasta to this day and that they are working behind the scenes to help guide humanity towards a more enlightened future. The story that involved Edward Lancer and seeing lights on Mount Shasta while on a train was claimed to actually be the work of the Lemurians. The locals from the area's towns had confirmed the existence of a mysterious community of people living within the mountain. And they had told Lancer that the community, the Lemurians, performed rituals in the early morning and the evening, which made use of strange sources of brilliant light. These ceremonies were allegedly known as the Ceremony of Adoration to Gautama, which celebrated their ancestors' arrival on the continent after their own had tragically been swallowed by the ocean itself. The locals explained that these ceremonies used extremely bright sources of a mysterious light which were known to illuminate the entire side of the mountain. The Mount Shasta Herald piece in 1940, where Edward Larkin details his sighting of light, the light was actually believed to be observed as a mystical city. Now, initially, he did notice something shining anomalously on the mountain. When Larkin had focused in and found that the object was actually something amazing, an enormous oriental-style temple, which he described as a marvelous work of car carved marble and onyx rivaling in architectural splendor the magnificence of the temples of Yucatan. Larkin went on to claim that he saw other temples on the mountainside as well, including ones in an apparent Greek style with magnificent shining white marble columns. Larkin, who went on to claim that in the vicinity of the temples would often be beset by mysterious bright lights in the evening hours, and that the temples and the lights were only the work of one source, the Lemurians. Even the 1962 Australian Flying Sauce Review article gave way to the idea that perhaps something supernatural is involved. It was said that this was the work of the Lemurians who were believed to be protecting their domain through the use of some unknown technological sorcery. Now, according to the legend, the Lemurians were already highly skilled in architecture and had built structures that were impervious to the effects of many earthquakes that do often ravage the region. Some even believe that they had the ability to control the Earth itself. And in 1904, when J.C. Brown was mining around Mount Shasta for gold and found a secret tunnel into the mountain, this is what he had allegedly found. Down in a several mile long tunnel led Brown to a complex of rooms filled with not just treasure, but ornate statues and shields and gold and crystals and copper plates. But of course, the most remarkable discovery was not just mummies, but an entire burial chamber containing at least 
27 mummies, all being described as anywhere between 6 foot to 10 feet in height several of which were wrapped in these ornamental robes of sorts. You could imagine how ecstatic Brown was about his discovery and claimed that it was one of the most exciting finds of the century. Now, it's hard to say exactly who the word got out to and how many they were told, but there is much speculation about his sudden disappearance right before the expedition into that tunnel that was set to begin on June of 1934. While it does challenge the authenticity of Brown's claims and the existence of this tomb, it also raises some questions. Was Brown taken out in order to avoid certain information becoming public when it shouldn't have? Is there an active conspiracy to cover up the existence of Lemurians on Mount Shasta? Maybe he just vanished because he was lying. And if he was lying, it's weird how his details line up with a book that would be released a year later that detailed nearly identical things. It's important to note that, to date, there is actually no documented evidence to support the existence of the Lemurians or their hidden city within Mount Shasta. The legend of the Lemurians is based largely on the book by Frederick Oliver, anecdotal accounts, and of course, New Age beliefs. It has been the subject of much debate and speculation over the years, but nonetheless, the truth behind the story continues to remain shrouded in mystery and debate. But folks, the mystery of Mount Shasta doesn't end there because this was just one rabbit hole of the entire rabbit chamber that talks about Mount Shasta. Because Mount Shasta also seems to be a hotbed for many things in the supernatural realm. For example, ample Bigfoot sightings and encounters, UFO sightings, among other strange, unexplained phenomena. Coincidentally, this is also the same area Siskiyou County, where the infamous Jim Mills footage was shot, which you can view right up here. In fact, the strange occurrences at Mount Shasta were not just limited to these supernatural rumors and legends. There are also very real accounts of unusual and inexplicable events that have taken place in the area over the years past. One such story involves a three-year-old child who went missing in the Shasta forest for roughly five hours. Now, to my knowledge, this story was was originally popularized and told by a Mr. David Politis. But according to the witnesses, and I'm just summarizing the story here, so bear with me, the child was gone within a second, and other campers in the area were questioned about his disappearance, but then the boy would suddenly reappear and told a story that was simply out of this world. His claim was that he had been abducted by a robot double of his grandmother and taken to a cave filled with spiders and humans, humans that looked like and acted like robots. Apparently, the boy was asked to poop on a sticky piece of paper, and when he said he didn't have to go, the robot grandmother got mad at him, and he also talked about a light coming out of her forehead. But the strangeness does not end there. The very same grandmother had her own bizarre encounter while camping at Mount Shasta. She claims that she woke up one morning face down in the dirt, having been removed from her tent and sleeping bag, and she apparently had a puncture wound on the back of her neck and felt violently ill and emotionless. She believed she had been bitten by a poisonous spider, but couldn't shake the feeling that something else was responsible. To make matters even stranger, her friend, who was sleeping in a separate camper, also woke up up with a bite on the back of his neck and felt ill. The only odd detail the grandmother could recall was seeing red eyes shine through the trees and their flashlights the night prior, which they had initially assumed were just deer. And it was right around this same time in 2011 that two other stories in conjunction with this one would begin to circulate. In September of that same year, a man from Los Angeles was hiking the Pacific Crest Trail near Mount Shasta when he had heard the beautiful singing of a female voice. Now, he followed the voice and became lost in the woods, only to be abducted and taken to a dark chamber in a cave. And there, he was stripped of his clothing and encountered a tall female with unnaturally beautiful blue eyes and bizarre, strange clothing. 
Now, apparently, she gave him a gift, a secret information, which he refused to elaborate on. Imagine that. Now, after surviving his ordeal, the man believed that he was the incarnation of a messianic Hindu god and even changed his name to the Lord Kalki. He had been lost for several weeks, leaving many to wonder what truly happened to him during that time. A bad acid trip or divine revelation? You decide. Another incident involved a man from Los Angeles as well, who was with a spiritual group meditating on Mount Shasta on November 11th, 2011. He decided to hike the summit and place a rock there, but a storm had blew in and delayed all search efforts. The man's body was found the next day at an elevation of 9,600 feet. But by far, one of the strangest and most unexplainable missing person cases to ever happen on Mount Shasta was that of Carl Landers. But before we go any further, I'd like to talk to you all about today's sponsor. Introducing Serpent Forge. No, it is not a video game. It is in fact an independent men's jewelry founded in Sydney, Australia. Every piece of jewelry is handcrafted with the highest quality materials, focusing on unique and intricate designs and pieces that cannot be found or replicated easily, only using 100% sterling silver and sometimes gold embedded with opal and other precious stones. What I love about Serpent Forge is the fact that they can not only make rings, but cuffs and bracelets and pendants and chains, and I'm not gonna lie, their designs are pretty sick. And shout out to Justin, the man who crafts all of this, made me this incredibly sick lion door knocker ring, which I absolutely love. So if you're like me and you enjoy jewelry with incredibly intricate designs and details of really interesting stuff, be sure to go ahead and check out Serpent Forge. A link is in the description below. All right, guys, back to the video. On the night before their visit to Mount Shasta, three men would stay together in a motel. They left the motel at 4 a.m. the following day equipped with their ice axes, crampons, climbing clothing, and everything else they would need. Now, their destination was Bunny Flat, which was an area that was pretty well covered with deep snowdrifts even into spring and May. From there, they would hike four miles to horse camp. Now, the next night, they would go and camp at a location on the mountain called 5050 Plateau, which is below Lake Helen. This is where most climbers would rest before the last push up to the top of the summit. Now, one of the climbers, Carl, was taking a drug called Diamox to combat the effects of altitude sickness. He was also suffering from things like diarrhea and he wasn't feeling well, and so he had to leave the tent several times during the night so he could relieve himself in the midst of this blowing cold gale. In the morning, he continued to complain of feeling ill and unwell, and he would leave the 50-50 location without his friends to try and get a head start up towards Lake Helen as he was feeling cold and under the weather. Now, both his friends, Milton and Barry, would watch as Carl just disappeared around the curve of the mountain and becoming smaller and smaller until he was completely out of sight. They would wait for him to reappear, but he never did. It was as if he had simply just vanished into thin air. Both Milton and Barry were worried and confused and sick. This is when Milton and Barry decided to pack up themselves and leave camp in an attempt to find Carl along the way. They would leave their camping gear behind, intending to come back for it later, and they set off towards Lake Helen to check weather and snow conditions of course. However, after a short while, Barry actually returned to the tent at 50-50 as he too was feeling ill and under the weather. At this point, all three climbers were now completely separated and now isolated and alone on the mountain, which this is a situation that no experienced hiker would ever want to find themselves in. Milton was successful in getting to Lake Helen alone, but once he arrived, he began to really worry about Carl's whereabouts. He would even ask a ranger if he had seen anyone matching Carl's description, but the ranger had only seen one person who was not Carl. Milton, trying his best, actually attempted to catch up to this person, but the person was wearing the wrong clothing and moved too quickly, and so, with no luck, 
Milton decided to head back to the original campsite to meet with Barry and hopefully reunite with Carl at around 5 p.m. in the evening. However, when he arrived, Carl was nowhere to be found and his gear and everything were still left behind. Milton now began to worry and decided to hike back to Bunny Flats to report Carl's disappearance to the authorities. He left Carl's gear behind just in case Carl might return when Milton was heading back down at around 8 p.m. The news of Carl's disappearance began to spread like wildfire, and the following morning on May 26th, 1999, authorities got to work in orchestrating a mass search party for Carl. The Siskiyou County Sheriff's Department actually used a grid pattern search method and helicopters equipped with infrared sensing devices to cover as much ground as humanly possible. The search was conducted by the National Guard, U.S. Forest Rangers, Shasta Mountain Guides, volunteers from various counties, and of course, members of Carl's own club, the Roadrunners Club. The search party would scour the mountain on ski, horse, and foot, and several professional climbers were even taken to the summit by a chopper to descend the mountain using separate routes. Despite this extensive search, there was still no sign of Carl ever found. There were no footprints in the snow, no trace of his body, clothing, backpack, supplies, or any equipment was ever found. It was as if he had just never been in the area at all. Even Carl's wife had a bad feeling lingering in her gut when Carl had left for the trip that something was just off. Something was wrong, she knew it. The top of the entire search and rescue operation for Carl was a man by the name of Grizz Adams, who is a longtime search and rescue veteran with well over 400 search and rescue ops under his belt. In fact, Carl and one other individual were the only people ever in all of his 400 plus ops where they had never been found. Grizz Adams actually spoke with David Politis and said this, in 35 years, I have never had this happen to me. We were all over that mountain. He was not on the mountain. We brought canines in. They didn't pick him up. We flew around it. We dropped guys at the summit. They came down all sides. They could not find him. They talked to people who were on the mountain. They didn't see him. There's snow around the path where he was and nobody went outside the path. Now, as far as what happened to Carl, Grizz had this to say. That's the million dollar question. He either went up it or in it, but he's not on it. In addition, a spokeswoman for the Siskiyou Sheriff's Department released this. We've just looked everywhere that we can look and we just don't know where else to look. What makes his case so perplexing is that the terrain he disappeared in doesn't allow for a great mystery. In fact, the areas are flat with virtually no crevices or steep cliffs to fall off of, and there is very little to no vegetation, so the places a human body can be hidden really dwindled down quick. Even the lake was thoroughly looked and combed through with nothing found, in case he had maybe fallen in and drowned. Even the canine units went through the areas and they found no scent trail of Carl anywhere, which is all very, very strange considering the distance between where he had vanished between the 50-50 plateau and Lake Helen is roughly only 650 feet. There should be no reason to not find a trace of Carl anywhere. In addition to all of this, Carl wasn't out in the middle of the deep woods in the middle of nowhere. In fact, there were at least 50 to 100 other people around Lake Helen at the time of his disappearance, which makes this all more strange. Even his backpack was left behind at the 50-50 plateau. Now, if we look critically and Carl succumbed to hypothermia, he would have left behind clothing like boots or something. And in the last 20 years alone, nothing has ever been found. If this was in fact a case of delirium caused by his medication, he wouldn't have made it far where he was walking. You might even suggest that a bear or coyotes got him, but they only ever appear at lower elevations. So then we're left with really two theories to this case. The first is that Carl had orchestrated a disappearance between him and his buddies, making it look like he had disappeared and left his belongings behind to have his friends cover for him on his missing story. 
right? Now, the second option is that something had taken him. Perhaps the Lemurians took him underground. Now, personally, the strangest thing about his disappearance that really bothers me is you have a search and rescue veteran with more than enough operations under their belt to discern what really happened. Even he claims that there was no evidence of Carl ever being on the mountain, right? No tracks, no trace, no equipment, nothing. I mean, surely if Carl would have staged a disappearance and went off to live a new life, there would have at least been tracks or something. I mean, canines would pick up on his scent, right? But to this day, Carl Lander's disappearance remains a mystery. Now, if you've been on or around Mount Shasta and have any weird stories like I've discussed today that you would like to share, please leave them down in the comments below. I would love to read them. If you guys enjoyed today's stories, be sure to go ahead and smack that big old red subscribe and like button for content just like this. As always, guys, I love you all. Keep an open mind, and I'll catch you guys all in the very next episode.